Howdy. Greg Swan here. I don't have a whole lot to say, I don't think. What I really want to say is nigger. Maybe need to say it again, nigger. There was a <laughs> sort of protest last night in Phoenix with kind of redneck pawns on one side of the street and Muslim pawns on the other side of the street glaring at each other and trying to goad each other into violence. And uh, this was all a big demonstration of um, how we need to stand up to the scourge of Islamofascism. I've had um, Kurt Westergaard's Mohammed bomb turban cartoon up at the top of the sidebar of Self-Adoration for a week or more now. Um, along with links to my stuff about um, Islam that I've written over the years. And of course, nobody cares. Um, and I'm doing it simply because as soon as somebody says you can't do something, you must do it. And while there's a certain kind of niggardly admiration we want to owe to people who are willing to challenge the uh, lines that our Islamist neighbors are trying to draw in the sand about what we can and cannot say, whom we can and cannot draw, uh, the much greater boogeyman in American politics is the word nigger and all of its associated um, ugly slurs. There was an article in American Thinker that I read about who gets to use the N-word, and that was the way the post was titled, the N-word, um, because we're afraid to use the word nigger, that the word nigger apparently makes black people's minds explode, at least when it's not being said by another black person, that if you're a black person, you can stand to hear the word nigger two, three, four, five hundred times a day, depending on where you live, as long as it's only enunciated by black people. But as soon as a white person says nigger, then your head explodes, or my head explodes, or some other awful event occurs that we live in fear of being called racist, and we're so afraid of being called racist that it makes us racist. In fact, we infantilize black people by insisting that they can't have an honest conversation about race because you can't have an honest conversation about race without talking about race. So this N-word article that was too cowardly, I'm sad to say, or at least the editorial staff was too cowardly to actually use the word nigger. They might have used it in the post or at least in quotes when they were talking about the subject, which we'll get back to. But, um, it just made me realize that the one thing that we absolutely positively can't talk about is race in America and the way that we tell each other, signal each other that we can't have an honest grown-up conversation about race is in, that, in the form of that phrase, the N-word. The subject of the post was a cartoon that was made by Dr. Seuss before he was a internationally famous environmental liberal progressive neo-fascist scold I am the Lorax I speak for the trees I am Al Sharpton I speak for the niggers sorry doesn't work that way nobody speaks for anybody else we're all free and equal in the United States and if you have a case you can make it and if you make it people will respect it and they will yield to your logic but Dr. Seuss, before he was Dr. Seuss, had made a terribly racist joke in the course of three or four other bad jokes in this cartoon. You can see it on the screen now, and we'll scroll down, scroll down slowly so you can see the nature of these terrible jokes fly in your ointment, monkey wrench in your works. I like spanner in your works. It sounds better. Needle for your haystack, and then down at the bottom, take home a nigger for your woodpile. And all of the caricatures in this cartoon are ugly. Everybody who's represented in this cartoon is ugly. The shoppers at this pretend department store are are dupes. The salespeople are, are oily, sleazy cheaters. And the black people are represented as simians, which is an ugly racial slur on the part of Dr. Seuss. It is untoward and uncalled for except that everybody else is being ridiculed also, and these are all really dumb jokes. This is a cartoon written by 
an asshole who was pushing out work as quickly as he could and didn't think about anything because he got all of these expressions wrong. Maybe that was supposed to be the joke that he was deliberately misunderstanding these idioms. But I was interested in nigger in the woodpile. I had never heard it before. And it, you know, it was obviously common enough in 1929 when this cartoon was drawn that the guy who became Dr. Seuss thought everybody would know the expression. So I went to look it up and it is a, in the idiomatic form that you might hear it in speech, and I'm sure you're never going to hear it in speech, I never have, um, implies um, some kind of imperfection that stands out, something that um, betrays the overall integrity of the thing that's being considered, um, an outstanding flaw. But the interesting thing is the idiom comes from the Underground Railway days when white abolitionists, white and black abolitionists, free men risked their own lives and their property, their lives, their honor, their property, their posterity, risked everything to rescue people from the scourge of slavery. And a nigger in the woodpile is something that the authorities would say, the authorities hunting down an escaped slave would say, in anticipation that there might be a slave hiding in the woodpile or hiding in the basement, hiding in the masonry in one way or another. Um, and so it is a truly admirable expression when you consider the entire history of the phrase. But of course, we're not willing to consider anything at all like that. We're not willing to think at all about what matters in our relationships among races or among individual people, among neighbors. It doesn't really matter because everybody else is not me. The nature of reality is everybody else is not me. There is no person who has ever lived who could not truthfully make that statement. Everybody else is not me. There are two kinds of people in the world, and the other kind is not me. And to divide people up by races strikes me as being spectacularly useless because the only time you will ever encounter people is as individuals. And therefore, it is certainly beneficial to consider the individual virtues of the individual people that you meet in order to understand who they are, how they choose, how they will choose going forward, and how you can find grounds for mutual prosperity by trading with each other. And this is why I have always been a huge champion of the black middle class. If you read me going back forever, I'm, I'm always using black characters. I'm always demonstrating virtue. All the characters that I'm playing with are demonstrating virtue or vice. But I've always um, illustrated what I think is most admirable about the black middle class. And I was thinking about this yesterday. Um, trying to understand what that is, and the reality of it is I, I like the black middle class for the same reason that I like the white middle class that I grew up with when I was a kid in Illinois, and the thing that unites these people is their scrupulous attention to scruples, that what makes the black middle class so admirable to me is this, the scruples of the people who are practicing this moral philosophy, and I always identified with the rebel characters in stories where you get to see the black community, I always identified with the, with the Greek, with the exponent of Greek civilization who was um, always kind of steadfast against the bacchanalia that was um, too ubiquitous even before the advent of the welfare state. And it is that scrupling, that consistent scrupling, scrupling for virtue, um, that I find so admirable in the black middle class, and that's why I find it offensive that we actually cannot talk intelligib intelligibly about race. The most amusing thing of all it is that people think that political correctness has to do with what you say, and of course it does not. It has to do with what other people can hear. And that's why I can have the cartoon Muhammad at the top of my sidebar, and that's why I can say nigger as many times as I want to in this videotape, video sermon, video homily, you call it what you want, I can say nigger as many times as I want because nobody cares what I say, they care what other people hear. And as long as no one is hearing what I say, no one's going to bother to try to silence me. It's not what I say, it's what other people hear. And in fact, if you actually do have an intelligent conversation about race with intelligent people, white, black, brown, yellow, red, I don't care if you actually do have an intelligent conversation with progressives of any color, any stripe, 
they will agree with you in principle on everything that you have to say, but they will always couch it in a way, but, oh, we really can't say it that way, or we wouldn't want to take that position. We wouldn't want people to hear us think. We wouldn't want people to think that the truth is the truth, that facts are facts. Facts are facts. I admire the black middle class, no end. I loathe, detest, abhor the underclass of all colors, white, black, brown, yellow, red. Our Native American friends have gotten the worst of patern the paternalistic racism that undergirds everything that we do while we're pretending to have a conversation about race, that black Americans got a pretty shitty deal and manifestations of that endure, but the Native Americans, the people who lived here first, got the shittiest deal of all, and it continues to this very day, that the more that you suck at that, that big mother's tit, the less able you are to live a thriving life, a happy, flourishing life, a eudaimonious life, a life of egoism, a life of self-adoration, a life where you achieve your values in every abundance you can imagine. And this is the church of splendor. And so we will start out ugly by saying nigger, 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 but we're going to finish in Act 3 with a benedy because everybody can get better, but you'll never get better by lying about the elephant in the room, by pretending the reality isn't real, and by insulting your neighbors, by depriving them of the opportunity to live the fully human life, by calling things what they really are, by addressing the reality of our situation to figure out how to make it better. I am not a racist. I am the very opposite of a racist. I'm an individualist. And I see nothing but individual people, and this is what I respond to. This is the church of splendor, atheist, egoist, anarchist, but also non-sectarian and entirely ecumenical. If you can stand to hear what I have to say, I am more than happy to say it. And therefore, my congregation, the seven people who listen to me this week and the seven billion people who have the opportunity to listen to me later, billions upon billions more who come to be born after I've died. Everybody can listen to me from now on, and therefore I include everybody living now or living ever in my congregation when I say to all my niggers, peace out. <laughs>